What is going on everybody? Asshole Veteran here and I've gotten a lot of questions lately and I figured I'd start the new channel with all this because A. It's a really important topic and B. It has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the channel. Hence the whole asshole thing. Um, people have asked me a lot lately about my post-traumatic stress so I decided it's time to break it down a little bit so everybody can understand. Okay, so here's the deal. Before we even get started, let's talk about the different types of post-traumatic post stress, if I can learn how to speak. Uh, the different types of post-traumatic stress are all defined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition. I don't know if they've got an updated one, but this is, this is the one I've been using to the point where the pages are literally falling out. Um, what does this tell me about post-traumatic stress? What does it tell me about the differences between... Uh, say somebody who's got post-traumatic stress from domestic violence or sexual assault and somebody who's got post-traumatic stress from military service or combat. Um, first off, this defines every aspect of post-traumatic stress and very simply put, it's an anxiety disorder. Computer, what is anxiety? Anxiety is an emotion characterized by an unpleasant state of inner turmoil, often accompanied by nervous behavior such as pacing back and forth, somatic complaints, and rumination. Okay, so basically post-traumatic stress is just stress. It's stress that happens after a trauma. It doesn't equate to violence or anything like that. Now, what's the difference between post-traumatic stress from, say, domestic abuse or, or sexual assault and post-traumatic stress from military service or combat or something like that? Absolutely nothing. There is no defined difference between post-traumatic stress from one and the other. So it doesn't make any sense to try and convince you that this is going to happen with this person because they got post-traumatic stress from one thing and it probably won't with this person because they have post-traumatic stress from something different. Post-traumatic stress is post-traumatic stress. Next, let's take a quick look at what post-traumatic stress is, how it happens, and what effects it has on, on the individual person. Uh, in a minute we'll go through some of the things that I do to deal with my daily post-traumatic stress and kind of give you a rundown on that and hopefully it'll help you or it'll help you help somebody that you care about. Uh, first and foremost, I got out my human body coloring book. Uh, this thing is awesome. I've colored exactly one thing in it, and that is the amygdala. The amygdala is the emotional control center of the brain. When you feel happy or sad or angry or, or depressed, it all comes from the amygdala. So why does that make a difference when it comes to post-traumatic stress? Well, the amygdala, amygdala is a lot like a balloon. I have two here. We'll say blue is a normal person and red is someone with post-traumatic stress. Well, when a normal person has an emotional response, this is what happens. That's it. Fills with just enough air to make it solid-ish kind of thing. Eventually that, that emotion subsides and it doesn't take very long for that air to go away. Somebody who has post-traumatic stress at the point in which they had that first traumatic incident, this is what happens. Okay, this is obviously not normal. Now, coming down from this, obviously, it doesn't happen as fast. It also doesn't leave things the same as they were before it happened. We'll get to why that's important in a little bit. Now, the important thing to remember about the way that happens is, while the average person can go, look, I'm happy. Okay, it goes away. And then, look, I'm sad. Okay, it goes away. And then look, I'm depressed. Okay, it goes away. Somebody with post-traumatic stress, anytime they have an emotional reaction, the brain basically goes, Wow, that was easy. Sure, we may have overdone it a little bit, but we did what we thought we needed to. Let's try and calm down. Okay, you get the point. And it becomes easier and easier and easier in somebody who's experienced trauma to reinflate that balloon to excessive measures over and over and over again. Now, in the event that somebody develops post-traumatic stress over a short period of time, what happens is the brain goes, okay, I overinflated just a little bit, but it's okay because it's not an extreme. So, yeah, it's pretty much back to normal. 
And then the next traumatic incident happens. Oh, look, I overdid it just a little bit more. Okay, but it's still not too extreme, and, and it's fine. You know, it takes a little longer to come down, everything's okay. We're just a little out of whack, nothing too bad. Now, this is an example of what happens in people like emergency medicine and firefighters and law enforcement when they end up with post-traumatic stress over a long period of time. Eventually, what you get to is the brain goes, Okay, I only overdid it a little bit. Now, what do most people think of when they think of post-traumatic stress? Most people think of John Rambo. I mean, seriously, that is honest to God, the, the profile that people put on post-traumatic stress. But that's not what that nifty little book says. What do people really need to consider when it comes to post-traumatic stress? Well, let's consider how the brain works. The brain works like a stun gun. It's got two points of contact all over the place. Everywhere in your brain's got two little points of contact and a little signal fires in between them. So say that's a normal brain. Well, when you get your brain stretched out, those two point of contacts, well, they don't match up anymore. And suddenly that little bit that, that it moved doesn't seem like a big deal, but it doesn't fire right anymore. So when it doesn't fire right anymore, where it should be, the brain goes, oh my god, something's not right. Last time something wasn't right, I needed to go into a heightened emotional state. And it overfills that balloon. And then, of course, it takes forever for it to die down. Now, how do you decide what's going to cause that to happen and what's not? Well, it's just going to be whatever patterns the brain recognizes that causes that specific synapse to fire. Okay, so it's not going to happen every single time. Some parts of the brain are still going to do the regular. Whereas every once in a while, a situation or circumstance or an emotional response will cause that odd synapse to fire and you will get problem is, the more it expands, the more often you get, which is not good. So now the average person can understand what post-traumatic stress is and how it affects us and, and how the brain works once you've got it. How do you explain the emotional state? Well, that's a tough thing to do. First and foremost, anybody who's ever been in a car accident or a bike accident or a snowmobile accident or a any type of accident where they've felt that pit in their stomach and every muscle in their body tenses up and, and it's like impending doom. It's like, oh my God, this is my last minute on earth. That perfectly defines the emotional state of post-traumatic stress. Except where the average person can go, okay, well, I came down over the course of an hour or two hours or three hours. Somebody with post-traumatic stress, that balloon is much larger. So it takes days, weeks, months, in some cases, in some extreme cases, even years. So certain emotional responses where they should be normal for the average person automatically turn into a car wreck for somebody with post-traumatic stress and it takes forever for it to come down. Uh, now for me that means that it could be something like the other day my my son at six years old he looks at me and he goes daddy you're right here and you're always going to be there. I don't know where he picked it up but it put me through the roof. Good thing, right? Amazing. Put a smile on my face because I knew it was a positive thing. Well, here's the last problem with understanding post-traumatic stress. Okay, we'll call this the wheel of emotion. This is, say, the four basic emotions that people go through on a daily basis. I know there's more. Just bear with me. Okay, the average person goes, you know what? I'm getting married. So in the process of getting married, I am super excited and I'm also super happy okay how cool is that I get to be excited and happy the average person with post-traumatic stress along with that extreme version of emotion the the extreme overwhelming emotion they go okay well I'm supposed to be happy and excited but this is what I feel when it's spinning you can't tell which one's which so you get the point. 
So not only is there an extreme amount of emotion, but it's almost impossible to identify the emotion itself. Okay, that puts us in a position where we automatically default to how we reacted during the traumatic incident. Somebody who was in a military setting, uh, when they ha experienced that traumatic incident, their response, their, their training taught them, okay, confront the problem. That doesn't mean violence, that just means confront the problem. No problem. Someone who has post-traumatic stress from domestic violence or, or domestic abuse or sexual assault, during the traumatic event, their response was to curl up in a ball and go, okay, if I, if I just let it happen, it's over, it's done with. That's going to be their response. So the response that you're going to get out of somebody is really proportional to what happened during the traumatic event. Uh, there are more complex ways to go through all that, but that's kind of the basics. So where does violence come in? Because I know that really comes into everybody's mindset. Well, the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress in 2010 released a study that said post-traumatic stress, which is nothing more than stress, <coughs> doesn't equate to violence. Pardon me. What it does equate to is internalizing aggression. Basically saying that when somebody is violent, they're going to be violent to themselves because of their post-traumatic stress long before they're ever going to reach out and be violent to somebody else. But we hear on the news all the time, such and such was violent and they have post-traumatic stress. Well, the news is wrong. They're not telling you what's in that nifty little book. They're telling you what they saw in the Rambo movies. Honest to God, don't believe me? Go watch the Rambo movies. You'll figure it out quick, fast, and hurry. So what does that mean? That means that post-traumatic stress doesn't equal violence. We now understand how it, how it works and how it functions in those emotional states. Well, that leaves the impending question, what do you do in dealing with somebody who has post-traumatic stress? What do you do to try and make that better? That's not as easy. As somebody who has post-traumatic stress and as, as a minister who has helped a number of other people with post-traumatic stress, let me kind of throw it out there so that you can understand what I do on a daily basis and what I encourage others to do on a daily basis. Computer, turn on bedroom light. Okay. So as you can see, I actually have my entire house voice controlled, uh, especially my bedroom because it all starts and stops right here. Now, yes, it looks like a nice bed and it's all comfortable and that kind of thing, but there's a couple of key features here that the average person wouldn't see or wouldn't think of. First and foremost, I have my service dog. Uh, he is trained to do a number of things. One is, is if I wake up or startle awake in the middle of the night, he'll go look through the house and he'll come back and he'll climb up on the bed and let me know everything in the house is okay. Uh, that's aside from some of the technical th technology things that I have running around that we'll get into in just a bit. Another thing he does is if I'm having a nightmare, he will go to the side opposite of where I'm facing and he will snuggle up to my back. Um, most of the time he'll get under the covers to do it and the reason he does is because he wants to give me that sense of security that calms me down when I'm having a nightmare. Uh, it's what I've trained him to do. It's the two most important tasks that I have for him. Uh, he basically alerts if something's wrong in the house. He uh, we've tried putting smoke in the house. We've taught him to alert if there's smoke in the house. We've taught him to alert to my nightmares and so on and so forth. And we also have a home security system that if it goes off, he is trained to uh, go and, and basically assault the front door, uh, which we'll get into again in, in just a little bit. But aside from that, there's a couple other things that I have that I do. Uh, first off, I have my Amazon Alexa, my Amazon Echo in the bedroom, and I always have some kind of complex sound going while I'm sleeping. Most of the time it's something like thunderstorms or ocean waves. Uh, sometimes it's things like Mozart, but it basically gives my mind something to work on that's non-aggressive uh, that I can focus on that helps me fall asleep and helps me maintain that sleep. Next is the physical stimulation. I have prayer beads. Now, I am a Christian minister. Uh, so I do fall asleep, I keep these wrapped around my wrist, uh, and I do fall asleep praying on these beads. Why? Because it's a passive stimulation on the physical senses. Uh, it gives me something to focus on. 
that's all well and good, but there needs to be more, okay? My post-traumatic stress when I was when I was sleeping at that period in time, at, at the period in time shortly thereafter, the bed was extremely uncomfortable. So I've designed my bed so that it's it's a double pillow top, it's got like three inches of foam, it's got nice comfy blankets, pillows everywhere, so I can tuck myself in almost feeling like I'm in a pillow foxhole, if that makes any sense. Uh, so the dog, the beads, the sounds, the, the bed, everything else, but there's one added thing that I keep kind of hidden uh, that, that really, really, really helps me when it comes to sleeping, and that is under this top blanket, I have a weighted blanket. Now that weighted blanket is on top of three, three comforters. Uh, why three comforters? Because it's so far outside of what I experienced at the point in my life in which I had to deal with that trauma that it actually causes me to be able to kind of refocus and, and realize that I'm not there. Now I've added this in with a couple of nifty little things like I have an under the bed light uh, that's motion activated. So if I get out of bed or the dog gets out of bed or I'm coming into, you know, from using the restroom in the middle of the night, I can gear that so that I can see where I'm at and what I'm doing and I'm not disoriented disoriented, uh, and things like that. Uh, so that's where my day starts and stops. Now, first thing in the morning, very first thing before anything else is I make my bed. But that goes along with something else that I have to show you. Okay, I have obviously a full voice controlled home automation system. There are a couple of things that are not controlled uh, by, by voice automation, but it also all runs through this tablet. This tablet has been reprogrammed and designed so that I can do things like turn the light, well it gives me the weather, but I can turn the lights on and off and uh, all that kind of stuff, but it gives me a list of my daily tasks. And as I complete my daily tasks, these are all my daily tasks. As I complete my daily tasks, I actually go through and I check the box off and they disappear so that it looks like this. Uh, as, as I complete the tasks, they just remove from the list and the next day the list repopulates and I get to start all over. Why is this important? Because one of the issues that happens when your synapse don't fire right is you start to have memory issues. Uh, this helps me with basic things like making sure I, I make the bed first thing in the morning or making sure that I, I brush my teeth because I can't remember if I brushed my teeth or not or making sure that you know I do, I do my exercises before I go to bed or things like that. Um, all the little things that people take for granted that very easily not only turn into overwhelming tasks but are easy for, for folks with post-traumatic stress to forget uh, go on that list, and that list gives me a daily checklist. Now, as far as the home automation system, the big button in the middle actually shuts down all of the alarms and lights and everything else if the alarm gets tripped, say, by accident. Uh, I also have the ability to turn lights on and off and, and silence this or turn it to video cameras or any number of other things. It gives me a list of the emails, the time, the weather, all that kind of stuff, all on this one panel that I can see from bed. Uh, that's important because if I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm disoriented and things like this, this little bit actually helps me recenter. Okay, so I can go through things like, okay, well, something happened where I, I don't know, let's turn everything off. Computer. Trigger security alert. Sending that to IFT. Everything lights up. Every light in the house comes on. It's all controlled, and if I know everything's okay, I just hit that little button, and it all shuts down after a few seconds. Gives me time to crawl into bed. In the event the alarm gets tripped, I can actually hit that little button and kill the alarm or activate the alarm or even trigger phone calls to, to say, the local fire department or police department or whatever the case may be, all from this little tablet right here. Now, the reason I have these things on the tablet and not voice controlled is because of the fact that in the event of an emergency I want to be able to be coherent enough to know what's going on in my house and and move from there if I'm if I get comfortable with being able to control it by voice I can just basically tell it to shut up fall back asleep and everything goes to hell from there okay so another one of those things that people don't pay much attention to is layout 
Uh, the way my bedroom is laid out, I can do things like remind myself as I'm crawling into bed to be able to do my exercises. Uh, physical activity definitely helps me sleep. It's not something I do to an extreme. I, I, uh, I do some kettlebell swings or maybe some curls. Nothing too great. But I also have the ability outside of that physical activity to look around at key reminders that calm my mind before I sleep. Uh, I have a knife that was given to me by, by, one of, by my absolute kindred, probably the brother who knows me better than anybody. Uh, the guy who's messaging me right now, in fact. Uh, I've got pictures of my kids. I've got pictures of, of people that have really helped rebuild my life. I've got a reminder of, of being a Shriner, which is something I, I, I am just a sucker for kids. I have a tough time telling kids no. Uh, so it's something I'm very proud of. I keep reminders right in eyesight before I go to bed and when I get up in the morning to remind me of the positive things so that I'm not constantly stuck in that, that mental loop of, oh my God, this is what's going wrong. Okay, the next thing that's on my checklist that's part of my daily routine and the first thing I do in the morning is I get up and I check myself. Okay, I've got a, a blood pressure cuff that I check. I've got my scale that I check. Uh, and the neat thing is, is it's all linked up to this one nifty application, which is actually linked into my home automation system. That's one of the reasons I stick with Samsung. They, you literally can integrate everything with everything. Uh, but I get to go through every day and I get to keep track of how much water I drink and how much weight I'm gaining and, and all of those little things so that I can remind myself I'm healthy. I'm doing the right thing. I'm working towards something positive. Okay, now remembering that every re emotional response is an extreme emotional response, there's a couple of things when the house is in good shape that I need before I can do something like go out in public. Uh, one of the things most people don't realize I do because I generally try and keep it subdued is I change my appearance on a regular basis. Mainly because I don't want people recognizing me. I don't want to have to stop and talk and things like that because I'm already in a heightened emotional state. I'm one of those people where it's it's just very uncomfortable. It's very hard for me to be outside of my home, out in public where, where any randomness can happen. In the event I do go out in public, you'll generally, generally find me wearing a ball cap. On top of the ball cap, I almost always wear some kind of hoodie. Uh, generally with the hood up kind of draped over my face. There's a couple of things in going out in public that most people don't realize when it comes to post-traumatic stress, and it's something that even a lot of the folks that actually have it don't stop to think about. Okay, yes, I understand people have reached the point where it's the cool thing to do. Uh, post-traumatic stress is something they brag about or talk about like it's, it's a merit badge. But those of us who actually have it, we don't want it. Uh, matter of fact, I have more often than not run into people who are who are embarrassed by the fact that they have it. They're ashamed of having post-traumatic stress. I know I am. Uh, it's something that, that is very deeply embedded in me. Um, the other really key thing is, much like the safety here at home, there has to be some understanding of safety when you leave the house. Now for me, and I know this freaks people out, I carry a firearm. Uh, generally not just a firearm, but a firearm and some kind of automatic knife. Um, I am very well trained. I make it a point to train on a regular basis so that I can be as safe as possible. As a matter of fact, there are certain law enforcement officers not too far from here that can tell you that I have been in life or death situations and in spite of my post-traumatic stress, I've never even so much as thought of drawing my gun. Uh, they actually know me and the situation that well. Uh, so the reality is, is there has to be that expectation of safety when they leave. This bleeds us into a very, very, very important thing in dealing with somebody who's got post-traumatic stress. That is trust. Trust is everything. It takes forever to gain our trust. Once you've got our trust, it is devastating to betray that trust. You can literally push somebody to be borderline suicidal by breaking that trust once they're invested in you. Uh, it's something I've been through personally. It's something I've helped a number of people through. Okay, Emotions are extreme for us. There is no, 
middle ground. It's either full tilt or not at all. So when we take the time to invest in things like love and trust and and compassion and things like that, it's because we truly feel it and we feel it to an extreme. And breaking that is, is a very, very difficult thing for us to deal with. Um, even me personally, I, I don't deny it at all. I recently had uh, several people that I was very invested in break my trust and it was just devastating. Uh, caused me to hit rock bottom and pretty close to going under rock bottom if you get my drift. But fortunately, I had some great people that I do trust and that I have always trusted that have re that reached out in no time flat because they saw the signs of me being in that depressive state and they helped me back up. So there's post-traumatic stress and there's what I do to help myself get through just the average day. Now, that doesn't include the difficulties that I may face here or there. That doesn't include the difficulties related to other highly stressful situations. Um, things like bills, things like uh, divorce hearings and uh, child custody cases and things like that can very, very easily cause somebody who has post-traumatic stress to go to an extreme extreme. Uh, again, don't worry about them reaching out and doing something to you. The reality is every psychologist and even the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress says that they're not going to be violent to others. They're going to internalize that violence. That's where things like suicide attempts come in. So getting into a fight with your significant other, if they have post-traumatic stress, may not seem like a big deal, but it is. It's damaging. So I, I ask you, next time you're mad about something that, that may or may not be insignificant, consider that. Because we don't want that extreme negative. We don't want to be the downside. We don't want to be the reason you hurt. I guess take it for what it is. But there's post-traumatic stress in a nutshell. Of course, if you want to know more, you can by all means hit me up in the comments below. Uh, hit the like, share, subscribe, little bell icon, all that kind of stuff. Ask Whole Veteran is going to be a really interesting channel for most people. Um, but I'm more than happy to openly talk about my post-traumatic stress. It's something that I have been through and been studying and been dealing with, not only in myself, but in others, for quite some time. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you all have a good day. Hope good things happen for you.